we have Sofia Puerto, who is a bridge engineer at Michael Baker International. She has over 10 years of experience working in the public, private, and academic sectors. She works for Wisconsin DOT um, as a bridge rating engineer and currently is a bridge engineer at Michael Baker International. She, learned, she earned her PhD from uh, Tufts University in February of 2021. Um, as, a, as a researcher, she has focused on the study of existing complex bridges and structures, uh, sorry, for, of existing complex bridges and connections. Our second speaker is Daniel Baxter, who is a senior bridge engineer and bridge department manager at Michael Baker. He is a bridge department manager uh, at the Minneapolis office, where he also serves as a project manager and senior bridge engineer. He has been involved in both the rehab, design, and load rating uh, of many complex bridges, such as the Third Avenue Bridge, Winona Bridge, High Ridge, High Bridge, Franklin Avenue Bridge, Lafayette Bridge, and Hastings Bridge, all over the Mississippi River. He also recently led the analysis of 18 existing peer cap with sectional and strut and tie methods and helped develop procedures for the design of 38 new peer caps using the strut and tie method. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and make Daniel the presenter so that he can go ahead and get started. Daniel, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Um, if anybody can't hear myself or Daniel at this moment, please raise your hand. Um, but I think everybody should be able to hear us right now. Okay, great. Well, the, thanks for the introduction, Luciana, and the invitation to present. We really appreciate it. Uh, can you see my title screen? Okay, I'll assume that's a yes. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining uh, for our right, uh, Daniel, No, we can't see your screen yet. <laughs> you cannot? No. Okay, let's see if I click on this. Okay, now, yep, it's up. Okay, great. Oh, wait, great. yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, thanks everyone uh, for joining our webinar about analysis and modeling considerations for trust bridges. Uh, today, I'll start off by talking about uh, some analysis and modeling considerations for trust bridges, as the title suggests. And um, then Sophia is going to talk uh, about our case study for uh, the Winona Bridge Rehabilitation, and I'll talk about uh, the Interbelt Bridge uh, analysis, uh, which is a, a second trust case study. And uh, we could literally talk for hours about trust bridges. Uh, I, I, haven't, I have in the past, but luckily for, for everyone here, we're going to try to keep this to uh, about 45 minutes or so uh, with then time for questions. Uh, so the first... Uh, uh, Discussion point here: Analysis and modeling of trust bridges. We'll talk about uh, like what is an idealized trust. Like when we say we're looking at a trust, what do we mean? Uh, I'll spend some time then uh, talking about bending moments in trust bridges and when uh, when to consider them and when when not considering them. Which then leads to the question, uh, the often asked question of should a trust be modeled as pinned or fixed end in the plane of the trust. Uh, so I'll talk about that for a while, and then we'll have a discussion of 2D versus 3D modeling considerations. When is it uh, best to use use each method? Uh, so let's look at the definition of what an idealized truss is. You probably have an idea in your head of a, a truss bridge, you know, consider it consisting of uh, you know, triangular arrangements of members, which is correct. Uh, but let's look at the uh, definition a little more closely. Uh, one such definition is presented here that a truss is a structure composed of members joined together at their endpoints. Uh, the members are joined together by smooth pins, so they're free to rotate with one another, and all loadings are applied at the joints at the ends of the member. And because of this, with all, all the loads applied at the joints and the uh, members free to rotate at the joints, each truss member acts as a purely axial force member subject to either axial tension or compression. So this is the classical definition of a truss. So let's uh, let's take a little bit more of a look at forces in an idealized truss. So let's consider just one panel, a very simple truss, just one panel, um, triangular arrangement of uh, members here. Uh, I'm applying a, a force at uh, joint A, so all forces in this case, uh, and boundaries are at the joints of the truss. 
And we'll also consider that these trust members are pinned at their ends, so they're free to rotate with respect to one another. So uh, let's consider the axial force that develops in the simple truss here. The uh, diagonal goes into uh, axial tension to carry this force F, which I'm assuming is a downward force, uh, while the horizontal and vertical members would be in axial compression. And if we considered bending moment, there would be uh, zero bending moments in this truss due to the fact that the load is applied at a joint and uh, all members at the end, all three truss members at their ends are free to rotate their pin. But now let's consider what happens when a load is applied away from a joint. So now I'm violating that initial definition of a truss that all the loads are applied at joints. So let's say I apply this downward force F away from a joint to member AB here. Uh, the truss would still develop axial forces, but now uh, because I'm applying the load away from the joint uh, to remain in uh, equilibrium, it also needs to develop bending moments. And you can get a sense of what the relative magnitudes of those bending moments would be from looking at the diagram on the right there. And this is because I'm no longer applying the load at the joint. Now, let's consider another case where same truss bridge, I have a downward force that now I've, I've moved it back to joint A, it's no longer being applied away from a joint. But in this case, uh, rather than the joints being pinned, they're now fixed. So what happens then? Uh, due to the fixity of the joints, the uh, truss members can't rotate with respect to one another. And as a result, in addition to axial forces that develop, the diagonal is still in axial compression and the uh, vertical and horizontal member would still be in axial compression. Uh, bending moments also develop as a result of uh, the restraint of uh, bending of each member uh, at the joint, as, as you can, and you can get a sense of then what those relative magnitudes of the bending moments are from a uh, little image on the right of the, the slide there. So then, uh, considering these different behaviors, this brings us to two uh, pretty important definitions, I think, of the types of moments you see in truss bridges. Uh, so primary moments are defined here and elsewhere as uh, moments that truss members must develop to remain in equilibrium while carrying load. And uh, the, that case we looked at of uh, bending moments developing in these truss members when a load is applied away from a joint, that's a case of a primary moment because uh, in order to remain in equilibrium, these moments have to be there. There's no other way uh, except through the development of bending moment to carry that load uh, to support. And another term you'll sometimes see used uh, interchangeably with primary moment is that since that, uh, in this case, truss on the lower right there is loaded away from a joint or a work point, it's said to be eccentric eccentrically loaded. Now, secondary moments, uh, or secondary stresses, as they're sometimes called, uh, this is a term for moments and truss bridges that are not required to satisfy equilibrium, uh, that instead develop due to just uh, the restraint of bending at the ends of truss members and just due to the uh, deflections of the truss members themselves. And uh, they're not technically required to satisfy equilibrium because uh, as these bending moments get increased, if that fixity is released, starts getting released at the joints, these, these moments would go away uh, and the truss could carry force and just axial force again. Now, a really important thing to note here is that when you see the term secondary moment or the term secondary stress used in the terms of truss analysis, it's not the same as second order moment as the term second order moment. Uh, which, and those are you know, so-called second order moments are caused by axial forces applied to compression members in their deflected position. And you can get a sense of what they are through uh, geometric nonlinear analysis or other approximate members. But uh, the secondary moments uh, referring to here in terms of trusses, these are a first order force. It's just a, a term to di differentiate them from primary moments, which again, are required to satisfy equilibrium. So here's some sources of primary moments that you'll find in truss bridges. Uh, often uh, where joint, they, they often develop sometimes between joints between units of longer truss bridges where the work lines don't meet at a single point, such as the figure in the top right. Uh, they can also develop uh, for members whose centroid uh, doesn't can coincide uh, with the work line of the member where they meet at connections. Uh, they'll also develop, as in our, our first example, wherever a load is applied away from panel points. So uh, for the truss in the, the bottom image here, uh, the roadway is uh, the roadway deck is continuous and composite with the top cords. So that will apply uh, the 
weight of the deck. And uh, live load forces to this top cord uh, away from the work point. So that's going to be a source primary moment as well, uh, along with member self weight, which can become significant for longer span truss bridges. And an important thing is uh, where, wherever you have primary moments, I mean, it's all relative, but particularly for longer span bridges, or if the, the distance between where uh, joints where the work lines don't meet starts to be, you know, say a foot or more, uh, these moments become significant and shouldn't be ignored from my experience. On the other hand, uh, sources of secondary moments, uh, these are, again are rigid connections between members. So the truss on the left, uh, this is say what a traditional pin joint would look like. I mean, these types of joints probably haven't been used set for about a hundred years, but you'll, you'll still see them on older truss bridges where uh, this type of pin would have allowed the members to rotate freely with respect to another at the joint. But most newer truss bridges instead use more rigid connections where uh, the truss members are attached to each other using gusset plates with uh, rivets or bolts at the gusset plates. And this, this type of connection does give some rigid rigidity to them that prevents uh, relative rotation of the members at the joint with respect to one another and then gives rise to uh, the secondary moments or secondary stresses. So then this brings us to the question, uh, often asked question, well, should uh, secondary moments be considered uh, for analysis of trusses or is it okay just to use the more traditional assumption of a pinned uh, connected analysis? Well, this is a topic that bridge engineers have been debating for over a hundred years. Uh, in uh, Grimm's uh, book, Secondary Stresses and Bridge Trusses, he, he studied the issue in quite a bit of detail. Uh, this is just a, a screen capture from a couple of pages of his book. Uh, the right image is interesting because you can see how uh, he drew, he's drawing the deflected shape of a uh, fixed end truss, and it's the uh, deflections of these truss members that then give rise just because those, those steel members are being bent. Uh, to bending moments because of the member fixity. Well, he, he looked at the issue in detail. Uh, his conclusion was that in common cases, there's no necessity to calculate secondary moments or secondary stresses, which are, the terms are interchangeable. Um, but he felt that in particular cases, they should be considered where they have, you know, are of particularly great magnitude or where a bridge has to carry much greater loads than those for which it has been originally designed. And he encouraged writers who take an interest in the subject to examine particular trusses and publish their results. So it kind of left the uh, uh, question open. And the, I would say the next major development and consideration of secondary moments or stresses was in the design of the uh, Seattle Vale Bridge in 1916 by two famous bridge engineers, uh, Gustav Lindenthal and David Steinman, who uh, went on to design many uh, famous suspension bridges. Uh, but for this, uh, um, long span uh, railroad crossing of the Ohio River, uh, what they did is they used a reverse camber procedure where uh, the members were, uh, the connections and member lengths were fabricated so that they had to be force fit together and that the force fitting produced a bending in the members opposite in sense to the expected, uh, to the expected bending from dead load uh, plus one half of the live load. So, uh, so reference notes here that uh, this process involved cambering the trusses for full dead load plus one half of the live load, but assembling them and erecting them so that the angles between the members would correspond to the geometric form of the truss without the expected camber. So what this did is by force fitting those members together, uh, it put in a secondary moment opposite in sense to that would be, uh, which would be expected from one half of the uh, live load plus the dead load, which uh, I think they thought was prudent to do here uh, due to the long span nature of this truss and the heavy the heavy railroad loadings and most likely pretty large connections, which would have led to a lot of uh, member fixity. So this had the effect overall of reducing the secondary stress or secondary moment in these members and as a procedure that has since been used uh, for many other truss bridges. Now, uh, I would say the next I'd say important development in the examination of these things in the engineering secondary moment in the engineering community was this paper by uh, Parcell and Muir in 1934 on the effect of secondary stresses, which again are interchangeable with secondary moments, uh, upon the uh, ultimate strength of trust members. So what, what we today call uh, the, the strength limit state. Uh, so they uh, 
did a, a large number of analysis and laboratory tests of different bridge members, and they found uh, that for most types of members you'd find in trusses, the ultimate strength was practically unaffected, even for uh, cases of high secondary stresses from the rotation of the member. And they found that it was evident that the secondary bending was relieved by the plastic condition uh, at the connections as that bending got large, that, and they found that a you know, complete readjustment of the stresses occurred resulting in a nearly uniform distribution over the section that was the final state of stress. So if they find, so that nearly uniform distribution of stress is then uh, analogous to considering that member to be just uh, like subject just to axial load, which would give you a uniform stress distribution. So their conclusion therefore was that in most cases, the, the secondary moments uh, for ultimate strength design could safely be ignored. And this uh, uh, to this day like reflects current practice uh, Section 4.6.2.4 of AASHTO LRFD uh, notes that where loads other than the self-weight of the members, which would be primary moment, and wind loads, also a primary moment, are, there are transmitted to the truss and panel points, uh, the truss may be analyzed as a pin-connected assembly. So in other words, they're saying if all the loads are applied at uh, the joints, rather than say between the joints, uh, you're free to use a pin-ended analysis, which has uh, the effect of neglecting these secondary moments. Uh, this is uh, uh, further detailed in uh, ASHTO LRFD section 6.14.2.3, uh, which notes that stresses due to the dead load moment of the member shall be considered, and that's primary moment, as shall those caused by eccentricity of joints or working lines, which is also a primary moment. And these secondary stresses or secondary moments due to truss distortion or floor beam deflection need not be considered in any member whose width measured parallel to the plane of distortion is less than one-tenth of its length. So if you consider a member whose width being less one-tenth of its length, one-tenth of its length, that's, you know, trust members of normal proportion. So they're saying like extremely bulky or short stubby members, yes, they should take a look at that secondary moment, but for most cases uh, following this guideline, uh, ASHTO LRFD permits you to neglect the secondary moment at the uh, ultimate limit stain. And this is also reflected in the, the fifth edition of the Guide to Stability Design Criteria for uh, Metal Structures, which uh, similar to the uh, work of you know, Parcel uh, from 1934, notes that you know, secondary stresses for at least buckling of little effect, uh, because again, of local yielding of the extreme fibers of the members near the joints, as the truss is loaded to ultimate, the secondary moments gradually dissipate and can be neglected. Uh, so uh, that's a bit of a review on the you know, thinking of the engineering community for the last 100 years, which then brings us to the question, well, should trusses be modeled as pinned or fixed end, say, in the plane of the truss? Uh, where, again, if you have used a pinned end analysis, secondary moments are neglected. If you use fixed, the secondary moments are included. Uh, so following uh, the recommendations of the, you know, the current codes that as long as that LRFD member criteria is kept, uh, you know, I recommend PIN for the strength limit state. However, and this is this is just me, this isn't codified anywhere, I, I do feel that if you were doing an analysis for the fatigue, you should use a fixed connection, fixed end analysis, because those, uh, those bending moments are really there. Uh, they dissipate at the strength limit state under ultimate loads, but if you're looking to calculate a live load stress range uh, due to fatigue, I, I do, in a truss, I, I do believe you should consider them. And uh, I also recommend including the primary moments for all limit states, because again, uh, they, they are required to maintain equilibrium. And you know, one last note too, is that these recommendations assume uh, the truss members are steel and are connected with you know, gusset plate-like connections. If you're looking at a truss with more brittle materials such as concrete or wood, this isn't necessarily the case because those materials don't really have the same ability, I feel, to uh, dissipate that secondary moment at the joints under uh, ultimate loads. And uh, welded trusses might behave a little differently too. So let, let's say these, these recommendations are for steel trusses with uh, typical gusset plate connections. So uh, it's a little discussion of primary versus secondary moments. Also leads to the, uh, you know, partly leads to the question of, well, how complex should the model be if you're analyzing a truss bridge? Uh, so let, let's take a look at the pluses and minuses of 2D modeling and 3D modeling. 
I think 2D modeling of truss bridges is a, a great tool uh, that's valid and good to use for most conventional uh, truss bridges uh, to use to find the main member dead and live load axial forces. Uh, it goes well with using the lever rule uh, for live load distribution between different truss lines and uh, is a, a tool that has most likely been used to analyze almost all the truss bridges in the world that are that are in service, many of which, you know, a number of which have been in service successfully for more than 100 years. So I think 2D modeling is great. There are some cases, though, where uh, 3D modeling is valid, is a good idea and should be used. One would be, uh, you know, like wind analysis of longer span trusses, particularly uh, newer trusses where less uh, lateral bracing or out of plane bracing may be, may be being used than would have uh, traditionally been the case. It also can be uh, a very useful tool for uh, analysis of the types of floor systems typically found in truss bridges. Also uh, a good analysis tool if the structural configuration of the original bridge has changed. Uh, many highway truss bridges that have been in service for a number of years uh, have had uh, modifications to where to say like close intermediate joints in the floor system between joints between units, uh, which will then change the static behavior of the floor system in particular, and also a good tool for detailed finite element analysis of specific regions. This is a 3D model here we made in Midas of the, the new Milton-Madison Bridge, by the way. So uh, that Milton-Madison Bridge here provides an example of uh, when using 3D analysis really uh, was a good idea. This bridge has less uh, uh, a little less bracing between truss lines than I, th I think would have been typical for an older bridge, but as a result, and and is also quite a long span bridge, but as a result, uh, when looking at the uh, three, 3D model uh, wind load forces, uh, the dia end diagonals saw, you know, a fairly hefty amount of bending moment, uh, which uh, included significant uh, second order uh, effects too, which we uh, got, which we were able to get from a geometric nonlinear analysis. Uh, the bottom right shows the ratio of first order to second order forces, and um, it's significant of uh, second order to first order forces. Excuse me, and it, it's pretty significant. So uh, th this is an example, say, wind analysis of a long span truss, where uh, uh, 3D analysis is a real valuable tool to have in your toolbox. Another example of uh, where 3D analysis, I think. Uh, it comes in really handy is uh, for analysis of floor systems of longer span truss bridges or or tight arch bridges as well. Uh, in these cases, uh, you can often wind up with uh, the uh, the cords that are in the same at the same elevation as the floor system. This could be a top or bottom cord of uh, truss, depending if you're looking at a deck truss or a through truss, or uh, you know typically the the tie girder of a, a tied arch. These cords will often have different longitudinal displacements uh, than the first exterior than the exterior stringers and the, the stringers of the floor system as a whole, just due to them both seeing different forces and having different stiffnesses. And what the effect of this, which is uh, it can be amplified, particularly near piers where the displacements are most different is it will cause the, the floor beam to have to undergo quite a bit of out-of-plane deformation between uh, the exterior cord, the cord or tie girder and the exterior stringer. And you can see this deflected shape uh, shown here of, of floor beam uh, deformations uh, just due to dead load, in fact, uh, but also this happens due to the live load between the stringers and, and the tie girder, which you know would be, you get the same behavior for an exterior cord of a truss. And uh, this can be an important consideration uh, for, for detailing and uh, also a source of uh, fatigue cracking potentially, uh, as this can be a pretty significant stress range, this out-of-plane deformation. And uh, you know, 3D analysis feels a real useful tool in the design phase and also potentially uh, for, for looking at this issue during uh, rehabilitation, which is, uh, uh, this issue has been known to cause uh, cracking at the end of floor beams uh, for a number of uh, existing bridges. Here's just another view of that deflected shape showing the that out of plane floor beam deformation just due to the different longitudinal displacements of the exterior stringer and uh, the tiger. Another tool where another situation where 3D modeling comes in handy is uh, for detailed modeling 
of uh, truss bridges sometimes, uh, particularly for an existing bridge, it can be warranted just to, we've done investigations at least of gusset plate behavior in detail and uh, integrating these models into uh, an overall 3D model typically made of beam elements is a, a good tool to see what's going on from say a stability or, or yielding perspective, knowing that by using a 3D model, the, uh, the detailed modeling is correctly braced uh, the way it really would be. So uh, some conclusions I think from dissection about analysis and modeling uh, that in the vast majority of cases, uh, recommendation is to use pinned ends in the plane of the truss for the strength limit state due to the reasons we've seen. Always consider primary moments, I'd say, since they're necessary to maintain equilibrium. And you can use your judgment there for shorter truss bridges if you just have, say, self-weight moment, but particularly for situations where the work lines of the members don't meet near joints and longer span truss bridges, they, they, tend to, they start to become really significant. I'd say 2D analysis, my experience has found that it's sufficient for the main members of most truss bridges, but do uh, keep in mind to use 3D when appropriate and be consistent with analysis and design in 3D. If you design a new truss bridge using just a 3D model, it's typically going to show that the floor system and bracing is going to carry some of the dead load and live load, that, and that's behavior you wouldn't get if you used a 2D analysis with distribution factors. So. If you're having lower load in the main truss members because load is getting shed into secondary members in a 3D model, just be sure to design those secondary members for that additional load just to be consistent. Okay, so now uh, Sophia is going to talk about the uh, our analysis of the Winona Bridge where you'll, you'll see some of these considerations in action. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the Winona Bridge uh, was a bridge we worked on about six or five years ago. It's a bridge that is about 2,200 um, 2, feet long and carries State Highway 43 over the Mississippi River between the cities of Winona, Minnesota, and Buffalo, Wisconsin. Um, the bridge includes a three-span steel riveted cantilevered through truss with deck truss approach spans. Um, the Winona Bridge was originally constructed in 1942 and it was rehabilitated in 1985 and eventually closed down in 2008 after inspections revealed that there was some severe rusting on the gusset plates, plates on the approach span deck trusses. Um, after that closure, um, we that's where we came in and we uh, designed some rehab um, that was finalized in 2019. Today, just as before, um, the bridge continues to be critically important for the local economy and accommodates uh, approximately 12,000 cars every day. Next, please. So why was this bridge uh, rehabbed instead of replaced? Um, so, well, first of all, there was it was clearly damaged, uh, but second, um, it is historically important to the state because it's Minnesota's only surviving pre-war cantilever through truss bridge. So the state didn't want to just get rid of it. It wanted to have a, um, some, it, the state just wanted to fix it and make sure they, they kept that historical importance. Next, please. So when we came in, the goals of the project were first and foremost to strengthen the through truss and remove current load restrictions. Um, we wanted to extend the life of the truss by 50 years at least. And doing that, we added internal uh, redundancy to um, all the critical fracture critical members as well. So basically for the design criteria, we use LR, LRFR uh, um, code and we make sure that all inventory ratings were over one. Um, we also made, took into account the slenderness ratio and modified uh, incorporating the existence of lacing. Uh, we also actually took into account compound buckling, um, and we will later see what compound buckling is, uh, in members that exceeded 75% of global slenderness ratio. We also included or took into account local buckling for slender um, member elements. Compound buckling um, 
actually reduces the compression strength and it is the interaction between global buckling and the localized buckling of flange components between connectors. The, effects, the effective axial stiffness is reduced because both the formations, global and local, are considered and eventually uh, the effective axial stiffness is reduced and therefore reduces the capacity of a member. Um, to figure out how to how much to reduce this capacity, we had to actually dig out some research work and we found this really nice paper that provides an easy way to calculate beta and eventually affect uh, the capacity of a member by beta. Um, beta is calculated based on local and global slender, slenderness of the element as well as the, as the panel separation and the expected local and global deformations. Now, now, once we had all uh, all we needed, uh, basically what we had to do also was to create a 2D finite element model, and we also created a 3D finite element model. The reason why we did this is because sometimes you see things on the 2D model or on the 3D models that you don't see on a 2D model. For example, in a 2D model, most of our trust members had a really low DC ratio. And most likely that DC ratio was low because we took a conservative approach when calculating the distribution factors. Um, however, in the 3D model, uh, we also noticed that the vertical members under the piers and end diagonals shown to be critical under wind loads. Now, for the final analysis, we use results from both 2D and 3D finite element model. Um, and we pick the most critical demands from both models. Next, please. One interesting thing that was pointed out by the 3D model that we were not able to see on the 2D model is that we saw a 23% increase of demand in the floor beam um, at the uh, joint L14. This deck joint is actually located adjacent to where there was an intermediate deck joint. But in 1985, during rehab, this intermediate deck joint was removed and the demands of the floor system therefore changed, increasing. If we weren't to model this bridge in 3D, we will never have noticed this increase in demand. So this highlights the importance of also creating a 3D model. Now, regarding the uh, through trust bending moments, we consider primary uh, bending moments um, in all limit states. And for the secondary moments, we actually neglected them when looking at the strength limit state because we pinned the ends of the elements. But we consider them when looking into fatigue analysis where we fix the ends of the elements. Um, we also look into axial force and biaxial fracture using LRFR uh, guidance. For the extreme limit state, uh, we actually decided to create new load combinations. These load combinations uh, were taken or adapted from the design guides of arch and cable support signature bridges from H FHW8. Um, we, uh, forgot to mention as a live load, we, we use the HL93 loading, and we also consider the effects of eccentricity in every single member we analyzed. Next, please. The internal redundancy analysis included all compression, tension, compression and tension members, as well as gusset plates. On this slide, we're on this slide, I'm showing a detailed uh, model that we did of one of the gusset plates and two of the elements that were coming into the gusset plates. Um, both the uh, members and the gusset plates were modeled using shell elements, and um, the rivets were modeled using multilinear elastic links that also included force displacement curvatures. The redundancy analysis included uh, the analysis of the connection when one of the elements of the member 
failed. So in this case, on this slide, we had one of the channels of the diagonal failed, and then we looked at how all the elements behaved, including the high strength bars that you could see here as a circular member, um, just for um, adding that redundancy that we were looking at. Next slide. As a result of this analysis, we noticed that there was a 5% increase in the DC ratio of a member after fracture of one of the adjacent members. We also didn't notice any connection distress, meaning that we didn't see any failure or in the connection. Um, we also noticed that the high strain bars, they engage pretty nicely as the, after fracture. Um, and we saw that the nearby channel, the one that was remaining, um, was close to being in the plastic range of the formation, but wasn't quite there yet. Um, same, a similar thing happened with the rivets, uh, which also remain within the elastic range as seen on this curve here at the bottom side of the slide. Next, please. Um, based on the analysis that we ran, then we recommended, and considering that this was a historical bridge, we wanted to make sure that all repairs were hidden somehow. Uh, we recommended uh, plating on the course on, and on compression diagonals. We also suggested the, suggested the addition of high strain bars inside the members for tension verticals and diagonals. Uh, we also included or suggested including um, uh, plates on the floor beams and end connection, uh, the replacement of all deteriorated stringers, and the addition of uplift tie downs as well as the replacement just to make sure um, the, the ends of the trusses are also a redundant system. Now what's interesting, um, after the retrofit was done, uh, the Winona Bridge became the first through truss bridge in the Midwest to have all its fracture critical members made internally redundant. So we eliminated all fracture critical members or added redundancy to them. Now Daniel is going to continue uh, with this other case study. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sophia. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the three-dimensional analysis and load rating of the inner belt bridge in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, this bridge, it's, it's no longer standing, uh, but when it was opened, it was an eight-lane, uh, nine-span deck truss, uh, opened in 1959, uh, crossing the uh, Cuyahoga River Valley uh, near downtown Cleveland and carrying Interstate 90 uh, over the Cuyahoga River. Uh, it was unusually wide for a truss bridge. It had a 116-foot uh, out-to-out width and uh, with 90 feet between uh, the, the two truss lines and had a 25-foot uh, foot panel point spacing and was designed uh, for the HS15 design live load. And if you were uh, coming east on Interstate 90 on this bridge, you were treated to a very nice view of downtown Cleveland in the distance. But here's an elevation view showing the geometry of the bridge. It had an interesting configuration of uh, longer uh, spans that had a uh, suspended unit in the middle, alternating with shorter uh, cantilever spans that then held up the uh, adjacent suspended span in the, the next uh, longer span with a, a maximum span length of 400 feet over the river and then another 400 foot span over uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad Trussell. Uh, so due to the large uh, distance between truss lines, uh, instead of using floor beams between the trusses, floor trusses were used, and these came in both a, a single level form and a, a two level form for the floor trusses uh, for cases where uh, the vertical members were 41 feet and higher. Uh, this bridge also, uh, after it was originally built in 1959 in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, this winding girder was added over the river to accommodate a, uh, an added on-ramp, which you can see uh, in the, the, the area of that on-ramp in the lower right. Uh, the winding girder was held up using diagonal struts that were attached to the existing bridge and was also connected uh, via floor beams to the, the top cord of the, uh, the floor trusses as well. So uh, Michael Baker was engaged to uh, analyze this bridge. 
in uh, 2008, so it was uh, shortly after the uh, collapse of the I-35W bridge. Uh, this, uh, you know, the owners of the this bridge noticed that it had a similar uh, variable depth deck truss configuration, and it did have uh, some, you know, fair, uh, you know, some deterioration. Uh, so the the goal of the project was to conduct a load rating and to conduct a rehabilitation as needed. Due to the uh, unusual width of the bridge, uh, the horizontal curvature of the bridge, and uh, the widening structure that uh, was was putting uh, was loading the existing truss, uh, these factors were sufficient uh, to lead the design team and owner to use the uh, to specify the use of a uh, 3D model for this bridge, which we did construct using Midas Civil software. And some of those lower screenshots you can see, uh, you know, there were some concerns about how the, the widening structure might be loading uh, the gusset plates of the original bridge uh, w w near where the widening structure was located because it was kind of uh, putting a, a sort of torque on the whole thing. And so uh, we did some detailed modeling at gusset plates, which we were able to integrate into the, uh, the full 3D model that was constructed mostly using beam elements. So the, the moments in this, this bridge were uh, pretty interesting. Near where uh, in the units, or the panels I should say, where uh, the suspended units are supported, supported by the cantilever units, there was a regular geometry in these locations where uh, the, work points, the work points didn't meet. Uh, you can see that in the next slide. If you look at the origin, this uh, shot of the original plans, uh, point A here, shown by the red, uh, the red dot, that's the work point of uh, the connection between the vertical and the lower cord. Uh, while point B, shown by the yellow dot, that's the work point of the connection between the diagonal and uh, the lower cord and the I bar connection that uh, connects to the uh, suspended span unit. And the distance between these two points was several feet. And this offset was enough. So uh, since the, the work points didn't meet at a point, all the force couldn't be uh, resolved into axial forces and a uh, you know, significant bending moment developed in these end panels in the lower cord uh, because of this offset in particular. You, uh, this is from a, a fixed analysis and you can see the relative magnitude of the bending moment in the lower cord here uh, due to the just uh, you know, mostly secondary moments in these other members. So uh, since this bending moment was developing due to uh, this offset, it was, uh, this is considered a primary moment and an example of why it should be considered. I think sometimes people might be uh, tempted to just, uh, if, say you were analyzing a bridge like this, just for simplicity to just resolve those joints together into a, a single joint. So you can use a, 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 a traditional truss analysis, but had we done that there, we would have missed this significant bending moment in the lower cord, which was also a member that had, uh, these members tended to have the most deterioration due to their location near the expansion joints between the primary, between the uh, suspended spans and the cantilever spans. Now, uh, due to the relatively short uh, panel lengths, but uh, panel lengths and a large uh, size of the gusset plates used at the connections, uh, this bridge did seem like it, it could be susceptible to secondary moments, and uh, the uh, the owners of the bridge, in consultation uh, with our within our analysis team, elected uh, to specify that this bridge should be uh, analyzed, including uh, secondary moments of the strength limit state, uh, by using a fixed connection analysis. So, since uh, we were considering the secondary moments in the case of this bridge, in order to avoid an overly conservative analysis, it was also necessary to uh, consider the effects of the mem member length adjustment for camber. That's what uh, I was, th this is the uh, erection process that was first used in the Seattleville bridge that I talked about previously, where uh, the general notes uh, for the inner belt bridge showed that uh, you know, the members were uh, purposefully detailed uh, to be slightly shorter or longer than their geometric length, uh, their geometric plan length, so that and, and when they were, you know, force fit together as part of the erection process, a uh, reverse secondary moment uh, to the dead load of the bridge would be induced in these members. So we needed to include uh, that reverse secondary moment again to avoid an overly conservative analysis. And the way we did that uh, was by specifying by uh, 
you know, using a construction sequence where we uh, erect all the members at in their geometric plan location in the model, uh, but then shortening or increasing the member length corresponding to the uh, shortened or increase in, increase, increased length shown in the plans for camber. And the way we did that in Midas was by assigning element temperature loads to each member where uh, that equivalent element temperature has the effect of either shortening or lengthening the member based on that element temperature. So we could have each, each member shorten or lengthen based on uh, the camber shown in the plants, which sure enough was able to induce uh, our, the, expect, it, the expected reverse secondary moment in these members. So it turned out uh, that the controlling members uh, were lower cord members at the joints between the cantilever and suspended span uh, with the, the member that controlled the entire rating located near the widening structure so it was carrying additional load from this widening structure beyond its original design load and uh, also was subject to some deterioration from the expansion joint it was also subject to a uh, force caused by uh, the bridge on the west bank of the river was moving towards the east bank just due to settlement and on warm days when the bridge thermally expanded those members came into contact and they were pressing against each other, which induced a, uh, additional force. You can see on the at the right side here how the work lines of the members and how they don't meet that distance between them several feet, which then induces this, uh, you know, what was a, a fairly significant bending moment in the analysis in addition to the axial forces in this member. So since uh, we were seeing that it, it appeared the rating and required uh, rehabilitation was being controlled by these bending moments. And the owner, uh, understandably, you know, wanted to see some verification of that this behavior was actually happening in the field. Uh, so that, mo that member, L300, L301, and a couple others were instrumented, and the Ohio Department of Transportation placed dump trucks of a, a known weight over the bridge uh, in the middle of the night. The, the bridge was temporarily closed for this. And strains were compared to those predicted from the model. Uh, they weren't exactly the same, uh, but they were pretty close. And uh, they showed that the uh, the overall pattern of uh, increasing strain due to a predicted bending moment uh, through the uh, depth of the member uh, as you go as you increase in height from the bottom flange plate base uh, was as the model predicted. So that those uh, the bending moments predicted by the model, uh, th this data showed they were there in real life. Some um, additional detailed modeling within a, a, another software package was con conducted by uh, DeSalt uh, Systems for the Ohio Department of Transportation for this member uh, using very detailed abacus model. And they uh, you know, verified our, con our conclusions as well and showed that uh, the likely failure mode of this bottom cord member was a, a bending failure mode, including uh, buckling of the top plate uh, just due to this localized bending moment that developed near the connection rather than an uh, axial member failure and uh, it just goes to show uh, the importance of including these primary bending moments in the analysis that if this connection eccentricity hadn't been included we would have missed this behavior so uh, some conclusions from uh, the interbell analysis where the bridge analysis was that uh, the effect of those uh, offset connections, or, or you could say that eccentric loading was very significant. Uh, there was also a significant thermal effect from uh, the, the west part of the bridge sliding into the east. Uh, heavier loadings above the design loading, original design loading and deterioration made these factors more significant. Uh, Three-dimensional modeling we thought was a useful tool uh, due to the uh, complexity of this bridge, the unusual widening structure that was loading the existing truss in an unconventional way. Uh, and you know the horizontal curvature and, and width. But we did also see that with the member length adjustment procedure from, from cambering included uh, in the analysis, uh, panels with only secondary moments from that fixed connection analysis did not control the rating. So mo most likely a, a pin connection analysis away from the joints where there's that joint eccentricity uh, would have produced a, an accurate load rating for the structure. But the, uh, the bridge, as I mentioned, uh, it's no longer standing. Our, uh, our rehab enabled it to uh, be kept into service until it could be replaced. And there are uh, two new, uh, uh, new bridges there now. Well, a number of people were involved in the, the Interbelt Bridge Analysis. I just 
uh, scratched the surface of it. So I just wanted to uh, briefly acknowledge uh, these folks, uh, as well as the uh, Winona Bridge uh, analysis. Uh, Keith Mulnow was the project manager for MnDOT. Ken Sin was the project manager for uh, Michael Baker. Uh, yeah, and a number, a number of folks were involved in that too, more than mentioned on this slide. Uh, so, so with that, I'd like to to thank everyone for attending, and uh, hope hope you found this useful. And we do have some time for questions now. All right, thank you guys so much. That was a really great um, presentation. So we're actually collecting all of the questions right now. Uh, so just give me one second, and I'm gonna put them up. Um, we actually have a couple, so I'm gonna refresh a couple times but um for now i'll show you what, what we have give me one second let me... hopefully they're not too tough we'll see <laughs> let me make myself a presenter <clears throat> okay so the first two questions we have are number one um, in the last example presented, were the two working points, um, where there were two working points are not meeting, if the trust was modeled pinned, if the trust was modeled pinned, uh, are we getting the effect of the secondary moments that may result from the two working point? Yeah. That, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, for that example, where uh, the two working points are not meeting and they're separated by several feet, I believe to keep that panel stable, you would need to model that panel at least uh, with fixed end connections. I don't, I don't think you'd get. It would probably not be stable if you had like a super short pin member between those those two work points that we saw. And but that would be a case uh, where the you know the two points not work points not meeting of a, of a primary moment, which uh, you know should be considered. So it, it most likely would if you would have been valid. For the inner bell bridge in this case to model those end panels where the two working points didn't meet with fixed end connections, and then uh, the rest of the panels that have conventional geometry where everything meets with joints could have likely been modeled with a uh, pinned end analysis with those end panels be fixed. Okay, thank you. Um, number two is was the 2D model with the plate element created in Midas Civil? Um, and then the second portion is what uh, what's Midas Civil's constraints? in modeling the meshing 2D plate elements? Oh, uh, well, the uh, all the models we showed, except that uh, screenshot from the Abacus model at the end, were created using uh, Midas Civil. Uh, typically, for these truss models, where we're not doing detailed modeling, we'll use gel elements on a model deck in a 3D model. Uh, for I, I think you might be getting at that, that really detailed model, the detailed internal redundancy modeling that we did for Winona. And Sophia, I don't know if you'd like to talk more about what your process was there. I can't, I can't take credit for that modeling. So right. um, yeah, so we usually, for our 2D models, we usually use beam elements. Uh, we don't use shell elements in our 2D models. Uh, for the detail model, we did use shell elements for both uh, the members coming into it. Um, so the channels and, um, and the gusset plates as well. Awesome. Um, okay, number uh, number three. How would you recommend analyzing temperature effects in a truss bridge, especially if using a concrete deck uh, system? Uh, that's a that's a tricky one to answer. I think I think it just depends on the bridge. I mean, I would think if just off the top of my head, it, and the times where I've seen temperature effects become the most significant are if potentially you have locked up bearings on an existing bridge and are looking at the impacts of those, that can create an, that can create a case where, uh, uh, where, where potentially uh, you get that uh, floor beam bending uh, between the exterior stringer and uh, the cord, that out of plane effect I, I discussed earlier, that can be made larger by, by lock bearings just because uh, the, the floor system might be moving when the, and the cord is not. Uh, I like the, I would say that I think traditional design of truss bridges had deck, you know, deflection joints in the deck every few panels. But for a, say, if you're looking at a new truss bridge where the continuous length of it uh, might be much longer, you might want to consider, say, in 3D or 2D, 
uh, just some strip of concrete deck so you can see if the you know the thermal the, the difference in thermal coefficients between the concrete and steel creates some kind of uh, significant effect in the floor system but I, I would say it just really depends on the bridge okay and then uh the next question is what is the best method for preventing preventing axile uh, force from transmitting into the floor system as tra uh, traverse shear in a 3D model? Oh, I think this question might be getting at, uh, like when you make a 3D model, how you can sometimes see that force gets shed from the cord that is uh, at the same level as the floor system into the, uh, into the uh, stringers and then can be carried as a transverse shear. Uh, from the stringers into the bottom, into the truss cord through the floor beam. I, I think depending on the fixity of the bridge, these effects can really happen. So I think you just need to be careful that you've modeled your, your boundary conditions correctly. Like often I, I've seen the connection between floor beams and the cord detailed, uh, you know, with very, you know, pretty pretty slender angles, so it's not a not really a rigid connection. So you might try introducing a uh, like some like a rotational spring or something at those at those connections that reflects a, a connection that is not super stiff, just so you're not uh, overestimating the fixity. And if say stringers do are free to move with respect to the floor beams longitudinally, maybe they're sitting on the floor beams or they have a a uh, slotted hole connection at their end or, or some such thing, you, you'd want to include that just to make sure that your floor system isn't modeled to be, you know, stiffer than it is in reality with respect to the truss. Another, uh, lastly, one of the reasons uh, we did do a, one of the motivations behind doing a 2D analysis for Winona, as, as well as the one Sophia mentioned, was to make sure that uh, the bridge would rate it, using a 2D analysis that we weren't depending on load being shed into the floor system in a 3D model. So another way to approach that question, I would say, would be for purposes of vertical loads, dead load, live load, just to make sure if you're, say, designing a new bridge that it rates out using just a 2D analysis. So you're not depending on some kind of load being shed from the main members into the floor system. That, that's just my two cents. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, number five, in truss 3D, uh, the deck carries significant tension under the vertical loads and lateral wind loads. How was this considered or was it an issue? How, uh, how, the geometric, how was the non-geometric non-linearity included? Um, and then pin slash rigid truss connections depends on the connection of the rigid, if the rigid, not rigid or semi-rigid. Uh, was this part of the decision of the rigid um, or pin connections? Okay, uh, I think it depends on on what kind of behavior you're you're seeing in the deck. I mean, for lateral wind loads, the the deck you know certainly will act as a very stiff lateral element, and it's I, I think it's important to consider the lateral bending uh, stiffness of the deck uh, for wind loads. Uh, it, it's true that if and this goes back to the issue I talked about before that if under vertical loads you're seeing significant tension in the deck in the floor system, you might want to soften that in the model just to make sure you're not doing something that's not conservative because uh, just a linear a linear analysis in MIDAS, the software won't know that that concrete in the deck would crack under tension and that there's only rebar there. So if, if you don't watch that carefully, you could end up with a system where you're shedding load away from the truss and into the floor system that actually you know couldn't be carried by the floor system so uh, i think there are a couple of solutions there you could uh you know soften the deck in, in the tension region we, we've sometimes done that by defining a cross section that just uh represents the stiffness of the steel alone uh longitudinal reinforcement for the strength limit state or uh, like i mentioned before that, you could just make sure all the truss works, all the main truss members work with just a 2D model with lever rule distribution. So you're not counting on the floor system to carry any of that load. And there's, you, you know, the whole thing works without any load shedding into the floor system. Uh, how is the geometric nonlinear linearity included? Uh, for cases such as that wind analysis, uh, you just need, 
we use the geometric nonlinear functions of Midas, where you do need to define each case you're considering as a static load case and just step it up in magnitude gradually and, and see what the resultant effects are. Uh, for most truss bridges I've seen, they're not, uh, those effects are not that significant, but you know, for longer span bridges, on a plane loads like uh, wind, and particularly if there's less bracing than might be traditional in an older truss, uh, they, I did see that they became significant. Uh, in, in terms of the pin rigid truss connection, the, uh, I mean, the literature shows at least that even for, you know, pretty rigid gusset plate connections that at the strength limit state, you know, if you, if providing your like length to width of the member stays within in those LRFD guidelines, LRFD permits you to use a pinned end analysis due to the region, pinned end analysis and plane of the truss due to the reasons we talked about that the, those rivets will start to the, the, the end connection from bending moment though starts to become more flexible as you as you approach the ultimate strength of the truss and that that fixity starts to get released uh so that that's how our uh, decision to uh use a, a pinned end analysis uh, for winona came into play just following following uh the literature and those uh guidelines Awesome. Okay. Um, and number six, what sort of multilinear model uh, that was used in this in this sorry that we used that was used to simulate the Revit connection? How did you verify the behavior of Revit in Midas? You want to talk about this, Sophia, or I can? You can go ahead, Daniel. Okay. Uh, well, for uh, that Winona extreme event analysis, we uh, we found just from the literature uh, shear ver uh, shear strength versus deformation curves uh, for the types of rivets that were used in the bridge, and then we uh, we modeled that using the multilinear link function in Midas, where you can you, know, you can approximate a, you know, a curve with a series of you know step straight lines to to come pretty close to to matching that curve so so that that's how we uh modeled the rivets for, for that analysis because we were pretty interested to see if like would they redistribute uh would they just get to the, the very end of the first uh portion of the curve and then just start redistributing force to the uh, adjacent rivets or would some kind of unzipping happen and you know based on our analysis there was there was more than enough uh, capacity to redistribute those shear forces to adjacent rivets, and it didn't look like anything was uh, any kind of cascading failure would occur. Perfect. Okay, and then we have one more page or slide. Um, so number seven says, when checking for primary moments, do you check using combined axial, axial tension and bending slash combined axial compression and bending code equations? When do you think such analysis is warranted, and how far do you think, uh, how far do you go with such analysis, knowing that these could uh, be overly conservative? I, I think there's some judgment there because we'll remember that when we're, when we're talking about primary moments in this context, we're talking about moments that occur to those work lines not meeting up, like we saw in the inner belt bridge, or uh, you know, self weight uh, of the member. Or if there's like significant eccentricity between uh, like the centroid of the member and the work line of the member, and and uh, I mean I'd say that if you see a case where there are loads being applied away from the joint, say that example of a, a top cord of a truss that is continuous of a deck truss that's continuous with the deck, you you definitely should be analyzing for combined axial force and bending in that case because uh, we know the live load and dead load is putting a fair amount of force in that member. If you see a case similar to the inner belt bridge, uh, where you have a significant distance between offset between work lines, at least our experience from that was that 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 created quite a significant moment in that member. And I would, and I think in that case, it's not overly conservative. You know, similar to the continuous top cord case of analyzing for combined axial force and flexure. As for the self weight of members and uh, offset of the eccentricity, I think that's more of a judgment call. It's probably a lot less important for just shorter span trusses than say for a really long span truss where then the uh, the moment from self weight and if there is any eccentric any uh 
offset between the uh, centroid of the member and the, the work line becomes more significant in, in those cases for longer span bridges. Okay, and number eight says, if the model is, co uh, con if the model is cons consisted of uh, line elements without detailed modeling at the joints, how much would you consider for in and out of plane un unrestrained length vector? And we didn't. We didn't have. Uh, we, I see we're going with this. I think we didn't have time to uh, get into that in, in our presentation today. Uh, but typically, what we do. So, for if what, what I think you're asking about is the uh, effective length factor, uh, k factor for compression members. Uh, typically, what we do there is uh, Astro LRFD has has guidelines for uh, uh, in for uh, the at, for checking buckling in the plane of the truss. Uh, based on, say, if gusset plates or pin connections are used. I want to say if gusset plates are used, it's something like 0. 0.7 or 0. 0.75, but don't don't quote me on that. I'd, I'd look it up. I feel I feel like that's what the K factor is somewhere around there. Uh, and for buckling, uh, for the axis out of the plane of the truss, I believe on Winona, I think this might not be prescribed in the code, but I believe in Winona we use a K factor of one just because there's more flexibility in the out-of-plane direction because that's the weak axis of the gusset plates. All right, and then um, number nine says, any recommendation about connection details to avoid water ponding? Uh, not, I don't have too many recommendations off the off the top of my head. I, I would say bridges such as Winona provided drain holes to keep to keep water from ponding uh, at the at the connections. Uh, probably one of the best things you can do is, at, at least with the Winona Bridge, there was a, which is a through truss, I mean, there was a very big difference in deterioration between the lower cord and the connections to the lower cord that were adjacent to the roadway than the upper cord, which was far from the roadway. So, you know, trying to use barrier details uh, that to just keep water whenever possible from splashing uh, onto the truss members, particularly in a, a northern climate where there's, there's salt is uh, also an important consideration. All right, and then the last one we have is: Do you think modeling revets as rigid links would be an acceptable would be acceptable for gusset planes when doing FEA? Uh well, I think if you model that, I think it would be acceptable if you model them as like multilinear links. I mean, you want to get the correct force displacement behavior in there, uh, and you want to be cognizant of what axis that axis that that forces acting in because you specify the different axes separately so uh, you just need to be careful and be doing some some bookkeeping to make sure your you know your resultant force makes sense so i i think it would be acceptable i mean again it probably depends on the the type of problem you're you're looking at though okay sounds on that <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking. Yeah, it really depends on like which behavior you're looking to represent on your finite element model. So you don't want them to be 100% uh, rigid. I don't think. Yeah, and the and the multilinear link with the force displacement relationship keeps them from being 100% rigid. It has you know the force versus displacement relationship. But I, yeah, I don't I don't think you'd want them to be 100% rigid either. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, I think that concludes our session. We don't have any more questions um, as of now, uh, but do you guys have anything else that you would like to add at all? Uh, not right now, just uh, thanks for inviting us and thank you and guys thanks everyone for, for tuning in. For, yeah, thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Thank you guys for the presentation. I know everybody enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody for attending. Um, like I said, this concludes our session. Thank you all for joining. Um, this video, this recording will be up later on today on our Midas Expert Network resource page so you can look it over again. Um, and yeah, have a great day, everybody. You too. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye.